The March of Time. It is Christmas time, corn, and in the fields surrounding this small Wisconsin city, winter has taken hold. Elkhorn is the Walworth County seat lying about two hours from Chicago and one hour from Milwaukee by road. It has a population of 2,975. The city is typical of communities which dot the Midwest Plains. Its people are of mixed European background, strongly religious. Their spiritual needs ministered to by its eight churches. Its schools are devoted to the task of preparing its children for happy lives on the farms and in small industries which contribute in large measure to the wealth and prosperity of the community. The life of the city is carefully recorded each week in the pages of its hometown newspaper, The Independent. And it is here that the March of Time begins gathering the story of Elkhorn at Christmas time. March of Time director Dave Rooley seeks out Claude Eames, the paper's editor, whom he finds hard at work pounding out copy for next week's edition of the paper which goes to press every Wednesday night. Eames is the logical person to guide the march of time in Elkhorn. I've come to Elkhorn to get the picture of life in an American community during the holiday season. Since you're the editor of the paper here, I'm sure you know more about it than anyone else. Well, I'll sure help you if I can. Fine. I've been uh, running the news down in this community for the past 32 years. My dad bought the paper in 1898 and it's been in the family ever since. We have uh, many community activities, everything from Sports to music. Uh, we're close to the large cities. Uh, we're two hours from Grand Opera. I like that. I like can see that. Uh, we have a good balance between agriculture and industry here. Oh, I think the best way for the March of Time to find out about Elkhorn is to go around with you while you gather the news. Could we do that? Sure, that's fine. I'm, I'm away to the story right now. Fine, let's go. From the highest point in Elkhorn, the platform around its water tower, the city seems asleep on this bleak winter's day. But below on its main street, the morning's activities have already begun. Editor Eames starts a busy day by making the rounds of potential news sources. The first signs of the holiday season are making their appearance at Elkhorn's main intersection, the corner of Wisconsin and Walworth streets, where the evergreen garlands and Christmas bells are going into place. Each year, the city takes the lead in holiday preparations, and the putting up of street decorations is quickly followed by the arrival of wreaths and holly and Christmas gifts in the shop windows along the main street. As usual, Eames stops to pass the time of day with Reuben Martin, the grocer, hoping to pick up an item for his weekly column. Reuben has been in business here six years. The first assignment on the editor's list today is a call on George Belton, Elkhorn's Justice of the Peace and oldest resident, who has watched the city grow from a sleepy little farm village to a bustling agricultural... Good morning, Judge. Good morning. You're uh, just about the end of uh, 30 years as a Justice of the Peace, aren't you? That's right. You know, I believe I could develop a pretty good story on you. The judge has reported that you're the oldest resident of Elkhorn, who was actually born in this community. Uh, just how old are you, really? Well, I don't know whether I'm 79 or 97. <laughs> somewhere in between, my dad. Uh, these past 30 years, there must be some pretty good high spots here somewhere. Well, we had the Tui gang here. Did you arrange them here? Yes, we did. Roger? Yeah. Roger Tui, then public enemy number one, blustered so loudly when all he faced was a minor fine for reckless driving that a rookie cop got suspicious and found his luggage filled with submachine guns. That little mistake enabled this country justice of the peace to help put Tui behind bars. Here's one of Elkhorn's young lawyers, Bob Lehman. 
who's just been re-elected Secretary of the Chamber of Commerce. Bob has plenty of competition. There are 13 lawyers in town. But this is the season when thoughts are turning toward Christmas trees and shopping lists and wreaths for the front door. Everyone is preparing for the holiday. At the high school, the Glee Club is practicing for its Christmas concert. Down in the manual arts shop of the high school, the boys are putting their training in carpentry and decoration to work by cutting out and painting figures which will adorn a nativity scene to be set up in the band shell in the park. Of course, there will also be a traditional Santa Claus display. Alcorn's children are brought up in clean and healthful surroundings with adequate space for healthy outdoor play. Their parents have read about juvenile delinquency in the big cities but have had little experience of the problem at first hand. For these children, the school is the focus of their interests, and many of these boys and girls will attend a new agricultural school to be built next year, expanding Elkhorn's facilities for educating its future farmers. The churches are another important focus for community life and sponsor many of its social activities. Elkhorn's residential areas are clean and well kept. The family of Robert McGill, a contractor, is representative of the young people who have been attracted to the city. Mary Jane McGill's family has grown since she came to Elkhorn six years ago. The McGills now have two children, a boy, Kirk, two years old, and McGill's favorite, a daughter, Diane, who is six. They live in a new home which McGill built just two years ago. Although the building season has slowed down since winter set in, there is still some construction going on, which helps to increase the basic wealth of the community. As the little city of Elkhorn grows and expands and investments and in property increase, the tax burden shared by each property owner goes down, as it does in any well-managed community. Such has been the case this year in Elkhorn and Eames makes his way to the office of the man best informed on such matters, the county clerk, who has held that position for 28 years and has just been re-elected for another two-year term, Leo Dunlap. Hi, right, Leo. Good morning, Claude. Hey, uh, Leo, you're the county clerk. Maybe you can tell me how it is that Warwick County has been able to present a lower tax rate this year. Yes, that's because of our increased valuation due to added improvements and uh, new homes. New industries and other improvements. How much additional taxable property has gone under the tax rolls this year to make that possible? $35 million since last year. $35 million. That's a lot of money. Thanks a lot. I've got another story to cover. See you later. Goodbye. New industries have done much to offset the seasonal nature of business in this agricultural community. There are such firms as the big United Milk Products plant, which handles 10 million gallons a year. The modern Klebe Tool and Dye Company, a branch of the A.O. Smith Corporation, which builds the harbor store silo the Draper Building Materials Supply Company, and the Elkhorn Chemical Company. 
But the manufacture of band instruments is Elkhorn's biggest industry, with a payroll well over a half a million dollars annually. Frank Holton and Company is the biggest factory in the area, employing 165 workers. The spinning of bells for the bass horn is the job of Howard Tess, who has been with the Holton firm for 26 years. He shapes the soft brass alloy as it revolves rapidly on his lathe, drawing it out with a steady, even pressure to its proper bell shape. Another old-timer who first went to work for Holton in Chicago back in 1912 is Axel Madsen. He cuts what are called the stems for various kinds of horns. Each instrument is carefully checked before it goes to the testing department. Arvid Walters is the company's chief instrument tester and design engineer. Here he is testing a trumpet against a chromatic stroboscope, whose lights indicate the trueness of tone. High school band is busy too, in rehearsals for the annual Christmas concert. Ted Binger, who also leads the Elkhorn City Band, is the conductor. The Elkhorn Clinic and the city's five doctors guard the community's health. Best known of Elkhorn's physicians and head of the Board of Education for the past 18 years, is Dr. E.D. Sorensen. Are you feeling pretty good? I'm feeling fine. And are you sleeping pretty well? Just fine, doctor. Good. How's the baby? Just fine. Fine, fine. How old is the baby now? Well, he'll be eight weeks Thursday. Eight weeks already? Yeah. God, I not seen that long. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll take your blood pressure again and see how it's getting along. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How's your appetite? Oh, just fine. Wisconsin is basically dairy country and its farmers are quick to adopt new methods and new equipment. Eames tries to keep his readers informed on such developments and spends as much time as he can visiting the farms around Elkhorn. A typically alert farmer is young George Lauderdale, a dairyman whose output of milk is picked up daily by a new tank truck, which automatically pumps the milk from tanks in Lauderdale's barns and greatly reduces the danger of contamination. In other words, George, this looks like the end of Washing the milk cans and sterilizing them and so on, doesn't it? Well, that's right, Munch. It sure looks good to me. Well, I gotta go, fellas. So long, Sven. You bet. Besides his 40 head of dairy cattle, Lauderdale has 125 hogs and 64 beef cattle. Young George and his father, Veen, do all the work. And taking care of the livestock keeps them on the go, winter and summer. They have about $30,000 invested in farm equipment to make their work easier. Of their 440 acres, 120 are planted in feed corn, 70 in oats, 50 acres in hay, and the rest going to pasturage. Corn is the basic feed for their livestock, and this has been an exceptionally good growing year. The people of Elkhorn are great sportsmen, and almost any winter's day will find a group of trotting race drivers and trainers gathered in the lounge of the Lorraine Hotel to swap yarns about great races and great horses. Almost any important trotting race in the country will include among the entries horses trained in Elkhorn stable. Well, I got $2,500 for him and Crippen won $16,000. Well, that doesn't make me too smart, see? The driver of the winning horse in the photograph is Art Shaw, one of Elkhorn's ablest trainers and drivers, who is shown here exercising a filly named Aircraft on the track at Walworth County Fairgrounds. Shaw has driven winners in some of the most important harness races in the country, and horses he has trained have brought the Shaw stables a wide reputation among trotting enthusiasts. Almost any resident of Elkhorn knows as much about harness race records as a city dweller might know about baseball averages. The horses must be exercised daily and then brought back to the stables at a walk to cool them off.
For the younger sports fans, the season after football ends is devoted to basketball, and the Elkhorn High School's team rates high in the county league. The season is just getting into full swing, and enthusiasm runs high. The games attract big crowds of grown-ups as well as young folk. Tonight's opponent is Milton Union High from neighboring Rock County. The Elks are coached by Lawrence Baxter, who gives his boys some last-minute advice as the cheering section of Milton Union High gets in a final word before the game starts. The Milton Union High always brings a good-sized crowd of boosters. This bell from Elkhorn High is rooting hard. But now the opposition takes the play away and gets a basket. And just when her support is needed, she relapses in gloom. For the players waiting to get into the game, the tension rides high. covers the game from the Elkhorn stand. The Elkhorn team finishes well out in front. The Elkhorn Common Council meets twice a month in the municipal building, with Mayor Charles Wilson presiding to pass local ordinances and administer the city's finances. Its members are among the community's most outstanding citizens. Men like Alderman Dan Lawrence of United Milk Products, and Ed Locke of the Holden Band Instrument Company. They are considering a motion on a routine transfer of funds for educational purposes. There is nothing controversial about it and no reason to debate the motion. So Mayor Wilson puts the question to the vote. If not so in favor, the motion will say aye. All right. Opposed at the same time. The motion is carried. The people of Elkhorn are intensely aware of the dangers of a surprise air attack aimed at the nation's great industrial centers. An Air Force radar station just outside the city, one of the network of such stations that stretches across the northern states, helps to sharpen this awareness. And the men who man it are a familiar sight in the area. The people know that their city lies along the Great Circle route by which such an attack might come, and so are interested in their own ground observer corps, which adds human eyes and ears to the nation's defense net. Among the volunteer observer state man. Aircraft flash. One, multi, low, one minute, Bravo Nectar, two, three red, overhead, flying west. Okay. The stories in the Elkhorn Independent each month of Walworth County boys being called up for military service also help to focus attention on national defense. This is the last group to leave before Christmas, and most of these boys will be given home leave for the holidays. Present to call the roll, as she has for every group to leave during the 11 years since Pearl Harbor, is Mrs. Adelaide Lackey, clerk of the Elkhorn Draft Board. Also on hand, as usual, is Editor Eames. Among those who came down to see the boys off are the grandparents of young Donald Olson, Mr. and Mrs. Frank Campbell, and his father and mother, Mr. and Mrs. Earl Olson. They all wave farewell cheerily enough as the loaded bus pulls away in the gray morning light. There are also opportunities to welcome back boys who have completed their service and come home from overseas. The Paddocks are gathering at the family farm just outside Elkhorn to welcome back their boy Jim, who has been in Korea with the 45th Division. The whole family is assembled in the big white farmhouse as the clock strikes midday. Happiest of all at having her boy back 
is Mrs. Charles Paddock, who adds a prayer for peace to the traditional saying of the grace. Jim tells the family where he spent his time, places like Inchon and Old Baldy Hill, but he is reticent about going into any details. At the table are Jim's father, his grandmother, and brother Ray, who helps on the farm. Then there's Grandfather Paddock, with a fond gleam in his eye as he listens to Jim's tales. And Sister Jean, a senior at Elkhorn High, who is fascinated by Jim's story of Christmas dinner last year. A regular Christmas dinner, turkey and all the trimmings, served in a bunker near the front lines. As the holiday nears, the shops in the business district stay open later in the evening to enable men and women from Elkhorn's farms and factories to buy their gifts. The usual heavy snowstorm is expected before Christmas, but this is just an early flurry. It's quite cold now, and the shop windows decorated with their holly and wreaths are frosting over. It is in these last few days before Christmas that the spirit of the season approaches its peak. Over at the independent plan, Bob Watson is setting the last copy on the linotype machine. As the hot slugs fall into place, the hour draws near for putting to bed the last edition of the paper before Christmas. Old Charles Waterbury, who remembers when Mud Eames was a little lad, works on the stone, assembling the columns of type and forms to go on the press. Uh, he, he may have another basketball score to go in there, but uh, you don't have to print. Uh, you won't print until three anyhow, will you? No. Okay, we can well, save we'll... room for it. Well, that's, that's going to be fine, Charlie. Soon the rollers on the big flatbed press begin to turn, and the broad sheets are run through. The press run takes two hours. Eames prints 2,200 copies each week, and the press turns out 1,200 copies an hour. Eames' last task is to check the first completed copy of the paper. The night brought a light covering of snow, but along the streets, much of it is blown away. Despite a cold wind, children on their way home from school are drawn irresistibly to the windows of the shops with their exciting displays of Christmas toys. Their eager faces reflect the timeless hopes and yearnings of childhood. At this hour of the day, the only shoppers along the streets are housewives, stocking up on groceries for the holidays. In the churches, the services already have taken on a Christmas coloring. The hymns, even this early, are likely to be Christmas carols as at St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church, where Mrs. Charles Burmeister, wife of the minister, accompanies the choir.
George. As the music of the postlude still sounds from within, Minister Burmeister exchanges greetings with his congregation at the church door. Men and women of simple tastes and simple pleasures. Peace-loving men and women from the nation's agricultural heartland. Another light covering of snow has fallen, giving Elkhorn a postcard look. Today, even the grim exterior of the courthouse seen from across the park has a holiday air about it. The boys are busy setting up the figures for the creche, which will depict a scene symbolic of the land where Christ was born. A line of camels in a silhouette against the ancient buildings of Bethlehem. In Elkhorn, Wisconsin, as in every city and town in the country, the thoughts of the people turn again to the fervent hope for peace on earth. Time marches on. The March of Time brings you each week at this hour an authoritative report on the people, the problems, and the places which will make tomorrow's news and become a significant part of the history of our time. This is Westbrook Van Voris, inviting you to join us again on this channel at the same hour next week when the editors of the March of Time will present another chapter in the March of Time television series. The program you have just seen will be shown to U.S. servicemen overseas as a letter from home.